There's only one institution that in the Bible God has told us that will be successful. He guarantees that it's going to be successful. Um, that institution is the church. You may have been thinking about another institution, and maybe you were thinking about marriage and the family, and that's a great institution. One time I saw, I don't know if it was a bumper sticker or something that says, marriage is an institution, but who wants to spend their life in an institution? Um, I don't know if that's appropriate or not, but uh, the church is the one place that God has succeeded that will be successful because Jesus says it's his family, it's his body, it's his people, and that he will build the church and even the gates of Hades, hell, will not be able to prevail against what Jesus Christ is doing in the world. We've been speaking for the last month or two about just ways of serving in that church and looking at uh, some of the different ways in which God's Holy Spirit empowers, enables, and gifts people who are followers of his to work together for the good of each other and for the glory of God. There's been a lot of attention given in recent decades about some of the gifts of the Spirit. And some of that attention uh, maybe at first was um, pretty extreme and, and went in one direction. Um, and maybe in the last 30, 40 years have, uh, have perhaps balanced out a little bit. To be honest, that some of the materials, that study materials, things written about the Holy Spirit, you're going to find more of that and probably some better stuff written on that in the last 30, 40 years, more so than you would even see in the first 1900 years of the church. There was not a lot of emphasis put on the ministry of the Holy Spirit until the charismatic and Pentecostal movements came along and perhaps some of the directions they went caused others to uh, look a little bit more seriously at those particular ministries. God's working uh, in the church and doing what is best for everybody involved um, started early on in what was going on in, in the movement of Christ. In Acts chapter 6, there's um, a, a case that happens where early on in the organization of the church, a, a situation came up, a problem came up. Uh, there were... Um, believers that were together. Remember in Acts chapter 2, where it tells us that um, that church began, the movement of the Pentecost, the Holy Spirit coming, and that at least 3,000, it says at the beginning, more than 3,000 got saved. And then it tells us that more were added even daily. So, so the church kept growing and growing and growing. But it also tells us that some of the people were coming together that they sold their possessions and they were helping each other. Uh, early on in the church situation, sometimes, let's use an illustration by saying, let's say a wife may have gotten saved and the husband did not, and it was not unusual for the husband to kick the wife out of the home. She was on her own, she had no place to go. The church came together and it tells us that they pooled all their possessions and that they had all things in common. They were doing everything they can to help each other, and, and the body of Christ was just functioning on all cylinders at that time. Until you get to about Acts chapter 6, when all of a sudden some of the uh, Greek-speaking Christian wives, and these were Jewish people who lived farther away. They were part of the disbursement that lived out farther than Jerusalem. They lived in colonies that were Greek-speaking, um, but they had come, they were saved, they were part of the church, they were living there together with the others, and they felt as though they were being shorted when it came to uh, some of the supplies that were needed, food, et cetera, some of the widows um, that were in that category, and they voiced their concern. They felt they were being mistreated compared to some of the Hebrew-speaking really Aramaic-speaking um, women, uh, widows, and what they were receiving. And so the church and the leaders of the church, the uh, apostles, the early leaders, had all of a sudden they had a structural 
organizational problem that they needed to deal with. And um, in Acts chapter uh, 6 and verse 3, okay, thank you. Is that, I don't know that I'm turned on. Oh, there I am. Very good. Uh, here's a verse that uh, tells us what they did. The, the apostles said, brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We're, we will turn our responsibilities over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. Now, I don't know that those win widows were slighted on purpose. There were a handful of apostles and leaders that were given responsibility and you know they were struggling their culture and the, and the government that was attacking them and now they're also given responsibilities for housing and feeding all these people 3000 plus people it would have been a lot of responsibilities and they probably just were not handling it well because of all that was going on and they said you know what we need to do we need to do what moses did and that is divide up the responsibilities and let other capable people so they selected some men to do that. In fact, when you look at the qualifications for what they were looking for, they said uh, they put the men over in charge of this responsibility. Uh, they had to be believers in Jesus Christ, men who have made that at least expression in their lives. They had to be reputable, people who uh, were respected and, and had earned that, um, that right to be in those positions, spiritual people said that it, they had to obviously have the Spirit of God in their life, and they had to have wisdom as well. It's kind of interesting because there's not been, and there's no way of dating this, this event, but there's probably not been very many days passed by, maybe just weeks at the most, since the day of Pentecost, since the church began and the coming of the Holy Spirit, and the gathering of all these people and all of them coming together, not a lot of time has passed by in that situation. But somehow, uh, they were able to identify and, and select out of the thousands of people, seven that met this qualification. I think it's amazing. I'm not going to pretend that the apostles knew all 3,000 people. But I am going to suggest that the cream rises to the top. And some guys who really stood out as caring, compassionate um, people were the ones who, who came to the aid and took over this. It's interesting because the church, first of all, was very, very young. Uh, I tried to do a study to see how many days have gone by. And, and it's really hard to do because it just, at one point, it just says, and then one day later, uh, sometime later, uh, other events happened, so it's hard to know, but it wasn't long. And the church was huge, at least 3,000, maybe four or 5,000 people involved by this time. And somehow they were able to recognize uh, the track record of everybody who's been involved there so that they could select this. These were men who were controlled by the Spirit of God, uniquely gifted to do a work that God needed to have done at that moment, at that place, at that particular time. <clears throat> That's the first um, mentioning and the introduction of an office that churches have and, and have called since then. It's called the office of a deacon, those who serve in particular capacity, and uh, those offices still remain functional. I'd like to direct your attention to 1 Timothy chapter 4 and talk about um, what the Apostle Paul communicated to one of his younger students, uh, Timothy, to, to just help us in understanding how do we know what God wants us to do when in serving him. Well, we're not going to give you specific, here's what you need to do. Um, but we will tell you the specifics of what Paul told Timothy, and there's probably some parallels and guidelines that we're able to apply to ourselves. At this point in time, Timothy was a young man, and yet he too had risen up to become someone very uh, significant and to be involved. 
Now, I want to remind us as we look at people like Timothy or Paul or, or some of the ones mentioned in Acts chapter 6, that no two people are the same. So God's not going to give you and the person three rows in front of you the same exact duty, the same exact gifting, the same exact responsibility. Um, people have different interests. They have different abilities. They have different skills. And that's probably because God loves variety. He really does. He loves variety. If, as Alan suggested earlier, you took a look at the leaves outside and all around, you would know that clearly God loves variety. And I think that activity Alan just couldn't bring himself to say was leaf raking. Uh, that's probably what he was thinking, but he just, oh, it was so painful, he couldn't do it. But in verse 14, it tells us not to neglect the spiritual gift within you. That's what we want to keep in our mind. Paul is telling a young guy, Timothy, that God has gifted you. He's enabled you to do certain things that are used by God to bring good for people and glory to him. And don't neglect that. Don't let that go. Don't, don't shun away from that. Now, Timothy had an office gift. He was a pastor. That meant he, he was able to do some level of leadership. He was probably good at teaching, and he did pastor kinds of things, whatever that is. Yet he was a young man, and maybe a little bit humble, and possibly more than a little intimidated when he was around other people who had a whole lot more spiritual experience than he did. And he was still told, don't neglect what God has gifted you to do. Do the things that God wants you to do. Get involved in those areas. You and I need to not neglect the ways that God works in our lives to help and encourage and to build up other people as well. Sometimes because of indifference, maybe insecurity, indecision, uh, we would probably tend to neglect that what God's doing within us but he wants us to boldly step out. I listed, I just came up with some that I call stumbling attitudes. These are things that you and I sometimes resort to and it causes us to hesitate not to do what God wants us to do. Some people are waiting for a sign from God. Uh, they're just, you know, I'll, I'll do what God wants me to do, but he's got to make this really clear. It's got to be the Goodyear blimp with flashing lights and all kinds of stuff in the sky. Um, maybe lightning going behind it would really help. And uh, I'm really looking for that one thing. Um, in some circles, they say it's a word from God. And so they're looking for the word from God. And I can tell you, God has already gave you that word. And I know what it is. Actually, Jesus used it. And you can find this. You can look it up. You can look it up. It's in Matthew 28, verse 19. Jesus said, go. <laughs> and that's your word from God. Go. Go do the things he's called you to do. Go make disciples. Go win the loss. Go teach people to obey what he has asked us to do. And that's when he says he's going to be with us always, even unto the ends of the age. We don't need anything else. You don't need God to do something mystical so that you, you get the message. He's already given you the message, and it is to go. Also, some may say, well, my gift is the most important or the least important of all the gifts. Some people are self-seeking. Some are self-abasing. But God never ranks gifts that way, and he doesn't rank people that way or their contributions that way. He always looks at every single one as significant, as co-equal, as we should be. There's, I'm up front, but that doesn't make me any more important than anybody else. Um, some are in the back serving. Some are right now downstairs serving all through the building. Um, Pastors are told in seminary that sometimes the most important ministry in your church is the nursery attendant because <laughs> that's the young families. And if you don't get if you don't please them, it doesn't matter how good you are. If you can't get them to stay, all those other things all work together. It's good. And we all come together to do 
uh, what is right. Nobody's more important, nobody's less important than anyone else in the body of Christ. Another thing that we sometimes do is, I've heard people do this, believe it or not, I've heard people say this, I only do the area that I feel gifted in. I can remember one time, it wasn't at this church, so you can all take a deep sigh of relief, but I remember talking to one lady once, and she was telling me about her giftedness, and I said something to her about just reaching people, and she said, oh, I don't have the gift of evangelism, so I never do that. It's like, okay, I I understand that because I don't think I have the gift of evangelism. But that doesn't mean that I don't go and talk to people and share what God has done for us. Uh, We need to be involved. Um, Yes, I need to do what what I'm good at and what God wants me to do and comfortable. I need to do that. Uh, But that doesn't mean I don't do other things. In fact, Timothy learned that lesson also in the second letter to Timothy from Paul in chapter 4 and verse 5 Paul tells Timothy that even though he was a pastor and and probably had some great leadership skills and some compassion toward people he still told him that Timothy you're to do the work of an evangelist as well now I don't know if maybe that was hard for Timothy or whether he just was overwhelmed with other responsibilities, printing bulletins and stuff. I don't know what he was doing, but maybe he didn't get around to sharing with other people, but he was told to do that. Don't don't neglect that. And I think that would be something God would say to all to us. In 1 Peter, he said that we need to be prepared to share what is the hope inside of us. That doesn't take anything. It's just your own story. Somebody says, why are you different? It's because of Christ and what he's done. Let me tell you what he did in my life. And, and that's something that we can do. Everybody's story is different. Well, another reason we can do it is we say, well, I quit doing things because. I quit because I wasn't appreciated. Or maybe because there was conflict and that was upsetting to me and, and it really was difficult. You know, Paul started in, in this uh, text here in verse 11, he, he says to him, I command and teach you, uh, I command that you should teach these things. You need to command and teach these things. Well, what are these things? In the first bunch of verses in chapter 4, Paul talks about false teachers who are going to come in and they have deceiving spirits. They are hypocritical liars. Uh, there are people who believe in godless myths. He also calls that old wives' tales. Sorry about that. Um, but there's all kinds of things that people are bringing into the church and in Timothy's day. And Paul tells him, don't do that. But in he says to him in, in the latter verses there that you need to uh, do what is a trustworthy saying and put our hope in the living God. Don't worry about those deceiving spirits. Don't deal with those lying and hypocritical people, but put your hope and your faith and your trust and all your ministry around the living hope that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we're supposed to be be doing. So in, um, in this passage in 1 Timothy 4, he's giving Timothy some steps of what he's supposed to do. And that first step that he told him to do was to be informed, to, um, to command and to teach these things, to be able to, um, to offset the dangers of those who are against the ministry in the church, but to, um, to be informed and to work there. He also, in verse 12, says to be open. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example. For the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. People in our congregation are really familiar with this verse because it's the theme verse of our youth ministries and has been for probably 20 years. Um, It's a verse that we call our youth ministries 412 ministries and it's based on 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12. Timothy was probably beginning to shut down a little bit. He might have been feeling inferior. He might have been 
not taking those opportunities, those openings that were right in front of him because of his youth or because of his inexperience or whatever he was sensing. And Paul said, don't do that. Don't worry about your age. Don't worry about your experience level. God has gifted you. You have resources within you that God wants you to do things. Do what God has called you to do. I say the same thing to you. God may have gifted you in some ways that you have never thought about, never thought it was possible. And until you step out and do in faith what God is leading you to do, prompting you to do, uh, you, you may never find out about that. You may not get to exercise what God wants you to do. If you're young, I would say, you know, there's a caution there too, though, because sometimes when we're young, we may not perceive things the way others do, and, and you want to be a little careful about that, but you should be very open to doing what God wants you to do. I really appreciated a couple, oh man, 15 years ago at one of our board meetings, um, one of the groups in our church came and they had um, an idea for something they wanted to do. And I can tell you without uh, a doubt, in that board meeting, every one of us sat there and said, I don't see it. <laughs> I don't know why. It's not a big deal, but I don't think it's a valuable thing. It doesn't matter to me. Every one of us like, well, we don't care if they do it or not. But one gentleman spoke up and said, you know what? If somebody in our church has a vision for something that could develop into a ministry, I think we should always say yes. And we try to do that. We try to say yes to people who have visions for things. Now, we kind of hope that it's a little bit thought through and uh, and that... There might be some some ways to uh, prove it and substantiate it, but you know, just be open to what God is is leading in your life. Verse thirteen uh, goes on and and says some more about this. It says uh, that until I come, Paul's saying, until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture and to pre uh, preaching and teaching. And that's where he goes on to say in verse 14, do not neglect your gift. And that's apparently his gift, teaching, preaching, which was given you through a prophetic message when the body of elders laid their hands upon you. Uh, be attentive. Devote yourself and give attention and concentrate to those areas that are your strength. Timothy was doing that stuff. He was reading the scriptures and services. He was preaching. He was teaching. Uh, he was being very effective. And that's what Paul wanted him to do. He was apparently backing off a little bit from that. And, and Paul was telling him, don't do that. Don't neglect those things that you're good in. I think also he's probably somebody who had maybe the gift of mercy, that he was a compassionate kind of guy for people. And Paul's saying, work on those things. Use those things that are valuable to you. In verse 15, he tells them to be diligent. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your, your progress. Be all in. Pour yourself into your ministry. Care a lot and work at it. It is all for God. Do what you do to honor and bring praise to God. He also says to be faithful. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Man, that, that should be like in flashing red letters in your Bible. Uh, watch your life and your teachings, your beliefs, your doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Watch out for the trouble that's going to come. And trouble is always, always going to come. Lots of times it comes from without, but it also comes from within. And usually the worst of it is what comes from within. Be careful about how you live your life. It's very, very important. Be careful about what you believe. That's very, very important. Be careful about what you are teaching and communicating to other people. It's very, very important. Stay strong and stay true and persevere. That's the most important thing is to stay strong and to persevere. Doing God's work and fulfilling his will is a labor at times, but it's also many, many times a joy. 
Don't be deceived into thinking I'm not important. Or don't be deceived into thinking I'm indispensable. Because <laughs> you're not either of those. You are important, but you're not indispensable. God is going to do his work. He's going to rise up and do what has to be done. But he wants to use you to do that. He wants to use you so that you can uniquely, with your gifts, contribute and, and do what you have inside of you. But he also wants to use you so that he can work in you and bring the joy to your heart and life that happens when you accomplish his will uh, with working with people. When you do not do your part, there's a void. There's a void in yourself. There's a void in others. And you will be lacking because of it. Watch your heart. Watch your life. Ask why about some of your motives. Why am I wanting to do this? Why do I do this in this particular way? Because it's a fine line to tiptoe back and forth across from doing it to bring glory to God and doing it to bring glory to ourselves. And we want to be careful not to tiptoe across that. Take risk. Step out. Serve and test God. See what he wants you to do. He just might bless you in a way that you never dreamt of. But do it. Do serve him. Do step out. Let's pray, pray together. Lord, thank you so much for your direction and your word and for the encouragement that we have to be your servants, to live the way that you want us to live. And God, this day, just open our hearts to the possibility and our minds of what you would accomplish if we were all in for you. Lord, we, I think everyone here has a sensitive heart to you and to your spirit. And I pray that you would just speak to us uh, and lead us along in ways that you know are best for us individually to do what is being called upon by you. Thank you for this day to worship you and to lift you up. Give us this day and many days to come where we can bring honor to your name. In Christ we pray, amen.